and welcome to this podcast brought to you by Just, the UK's first enforcement market integrator, and Aram, which has been helping organisations to prevent and resolve problem debt for over 25 years, with me, your host, Steve Coppard. It's time to grab a cuppa as we give credit where credit's due to our expert guests. For this episode, I visited Jamie Waller, who, amongst many other interests, founded JBW Group and the Enterprise Network at the Prince's Trust. Jamie's the author of Unsexy Business, and at the time of recording, he was in the midst of writing his new book, The Dyslexic Entrepreneur. I spoke to Jamie about the enforcement industry, past and present, and he highlighted the importance of making sure that the industry hears the voice of the front line, the enforcement agents themselves, as well as challenges in the procurement process and the potential impact of the Enforcement Conduct Board. His insight is genuinely thought-provoking. Let's dive straight into the interview and find out more about Jamie's expertise in this area. So, Jamie, do tell us a little bit about yourself and your history in the industry and your expertise in enforcement. Thank you, Steve. So, I guess... I've been through the whole cycle of of enforcement. So I started in this industry when I was 18 in 1998, when I was contracted as a self-employed bailiff. And I started my career with a few hours training, given a car clamp, a bunch of uh, magistrates court warrants. And those days you drove around in your own car. And I I went out and bought a a cheap car and I I was out knocking on doors trying to trying to collect debt. The industry must have changed an awful lot since then. (laughs) Thankfully, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, before we talk about the past of the industry, you know, like I said, I've been the full cycle. So I started as a bailiff. I I then became uh, an operations manager and employed a bunch of bailiffs and then worked my way through to setting up my first enforcement company and then my second enforcement company. And I sold that and then I owned a business in the in the technology area but supply into enforcement companies uh, and now i'm a, an investor in just which is an integrator of enforcement services amongst other services so i i really have seen it all over the past sort of 20 odd years i guess amongst all of that maybe the, the one thing that's remained constant because you if you go back 1998 uh, a market integrator wouldn't have been a thing I, I guess the one constant has been the agents themselves even though there would have been evolution there as well yeah, absolutely. And actually, you know, it's it, it's really weird because there's been a number of cycles of that. I hear a lot of people talk about enforcement and go, you know, the bailiffs were terrible back then. And, and I was given this little thought this morning while working out, knowing that you were coming here today. And I was thinking, were they actually, I remember some of my colleagues when I started in 1998, there were many really nice gentlemen, ladies that were very good at their job. They weren't thugs, they weren't bullies. So I think it's a misconceived conception that the bailiffs were the problem. Actually, there were problems, and I'm sure that there were some problems with some bailiffs, but it wasn't necessarily the bailiffs. It was a mixture of the bailiffs, the agencies, and in some cases, the people that employed them. But yeah, I think the agents have remained consistent, and there's been some positive changes, there's been some negative changes, obviously, bringing about better training for them is a positive, taking them out of jeans and baseball caps, and it's how they dressed when I first started as a positive. But you know, you, some might say that having them running around dressed up as sort of quasi police officers like they are in many cases at the moment isn't too much of a positive is a, a bit of a negative it's sort of creating this authoritarian view when two people come at your door and it's still dark in the morning and they're wearing stab vest and petrol blue colored shirts and they've got stuff hanging off them you know radios and, and body worn video of which you know some of this stuff is necessary but i would say probably that's a good example of how some things have change and not necessary for the better. Yeah, I can completely understand how if you're not somebody who's always in debt, then the first time that happens to you, that's not going to be necessarily a pleasant experience. But it is, I guess, for the most part, a consequence of people not being able or not wanting to deal with the debt in the first place. Yeah, it is. But it is too simplistic to believe that everybody that has a visit from the bailiffs deserves it. You know, a lot of people, rightly or wrongly, I'm not saying that people are not getting the letters, etc, etc, but rightly or wrongly, some people, you know, I grew up in a very poor background. My parents worked, but in rented accommodation, etc. And we grew up in an area where people did bury their head in the sun. And that doesn't mean that they then deserve something. And we've got to get, a, got to get away from that. Well, you know, 
I knock, knock on the door and somebody's petrified. Well, if you'd have responded to the letter, I wouldn't be here. That's, that's too simplistic in today's world, I think. And like it or not, we knew back in, so I set up my first enforcement company in, in 2001. I knew then to introduce a policy of a one bailiff to one door policy, because I believe that sending two people created conflict. So it's not new. So it surprises me if you fast forward to 2023, that we are now sending two, sometimes three bailiffs to somebody's door and that they're dressed up in such a, a manner that creates even more conflict because people are scared. So I do think, you know, that's a part of the industry that personally I would like to see has as a bit of focus, a bit of concentration. Now, don't get me wrong, these, these chaps and, and ladies perform such a difficult task. And in many cases, they do have weapons poured on them. And they, they so, you know, stab proof vests might be just a thing of the norm in today's world. I'm not saying that's not a good thing. I'm saying it's how we wear them. It's the visibility of them. It's the hanging of all of this equipment off of them. You know, there's no reason to buy a notepad holder and put it on your belt that looks like it's handcuffs, other than to mislead the person who you're knocking on the door of. And I feel that in some cases, some of this stuff's been done because it gets the door opened easier. <laughs> so, you know, if you go back to 1998, when I was a bailiff, I remember one of the more frequent complaints that we got in when I became operations manager was people used to knock on the door and say, um, what, what did they used to say? I didn't used to say, oh, please open. And then people would open the door. And then when they would complain and you would go and get a, a written report from the agent, they would say, I said, please open. So it was just a trick to get people to open the door. And so I would like to think that that's not the case, but we should probably see that in many cases it is. To look like a police officer is probably helping get the door open, but under the wrong premise. And then that creates conflict and then conflict cre creates complaints. So I think there's positive improvements, but there's some things that have definitely gone backwards. And that's clearly one of them. You mentioned, you know, that not everybody because they haven't paid deserves a bailiff visit. What role do you think data can play in that today? Well, I mean, it, it's starting to play a, a very vital role. Should anybody receive a visit before the data has been checked to say they owe it, they live there, they have ignore the notices, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's clear that, of course, no is the answer. They shouldn't. And data is expensive. And then working out how to use data is even more expensive because that means proprietary technology, that means building algorithms, in many cases, machine learning, and, and soon probably more artificial intelligence and, and how that will have an impact on it. But to invest a few pounds per case before any action has started has to be the way forward. But you only enable this stuff if the fees that are regulated enable it. And now the compliance fee in, in this space is, is supposed to enable that. And actually, I would argue that it does enable it, but it only enables it if there's not an incentive for it not to have the impact you want it to have. So let me bring that to life for you, Steve. If you were a private company and somebody sent you a debt for, for Jamie Waller and you knew that if I do nothing with it but send a letter, I might make £80. If I do something with it from a data and analytics point of view, it costs me £5 and I might not make £80. <laughs> It's, a, it's an odd thing for a commercial organization, an odd decision for a commercial organization to, to take. Now, contract your obligations can deal with that. Well, I don't care. It might be odd for you to do that as a private organization, but I expect it of you. And that comes from the creditor. And by the way, I'm going to check it and ensure that you do it. And if you don't, then there'll be service failure points and service failure points might lead to, lead to fines. But you could simply resolve it by getting, you know, where incentives go, energy goes. And we can't get away from that. And the fee structure has, of course, improved over the past 25 years. But we're still avoiding making those difficult decisions, which is that ultimately, if you don't pay at the first stage and you move to the second stage, the organization gets more. And we need some some more. So when we talk about smarts, I think we need some more smarts around how we deal with this fee structure for the next 20, 30 years. Equally, as much as we need smarts on should this person ever be visited, 
I think that's that's a really interesting conversation around the incentives and the fees. In the collections industry, we moved away from that sort of incentivization of, of the amount that you actually collected and more towards the right outcome. And I'm not I'm not sure that we're there yet in the enforcement space. Well, we're certainly not. And I mean, we also have the the added complication that you know eighty percent of the enforcement agents are self employed or micro businesses. So let me let me paint a picture of this, Steve. You you're a private enforcement organization with you know you're advertising a thousand enforcement agents on your books, of which eight hundred of them are self employed, mainly operating through micro businesses, a small limited company to enable them to deal with liability and, and, and tax. And you win a contract for a very large government or private department and you say, as part of this contract, we're going to, because our contract asks us to, we're going to really focus on getting people to pay early. The only cases that are going to come to you are those that really don't want to pay and are really difficult to collect from. Well, guess what? The 800 enforcement agents say, no way. Because what they see it is, is they see it as you stealing their money. You're stealing our cases from us. They would like it to go straight to enforcement. So you have this contradictory opposite forces pulling against each other that if you don't have 800 agents, you can't win the contract because the contract says they want 800 agents. But the only way you can keep 800 agents is by feeding them with work that they believe you haven't got paid earlier when you could have. And that is what's going on in the industry still today that was still operational 25 years ago. The fee structure has improved, but it hasn't resolved the underlying issue. And so when we were talking earlier on about you can deal with a lot of this through procurement, but not if you're still procuring on the basis of, well, how big are you? How many agents do you have? What's your coverage? Because it's contradictory. The only way you keep more agents keep more coverage is by giving them more work and it's got to be easier work than the competitor because otherwise what they say is they say well I'm going to leave you agency one I'm going to go and work for agency number two and then agency number two is going to win this contract from you when it's up for renewal and that is the difficulty that this industry has always had and will always have until somebody deals with the underlying issue that the reality is the compliance phase of collections should in my strong opinion, be delivered by a separate organization than the enforcement stage of the collection process. If you get that right, this industry will have the largest single improvement we have ever seen. That's what we've got to aim for. That's a really unique insight. Within that, it does make me wonder, Jamie, that if you are sending the enforcement agents out on 100% of cases, but let's say the data that you have, you can clearly see in that data that 15% of those cases, they, they have no ability to pay. Hmm. And, and you should screen those people out. Then aren't the agents effectively then wasting their time on 15% of the cases and they're increasing their costs because they're turning up at places where they can't afford to pay the principal, let alone the additional fees? Of course they are, Steve. But the problem is, you know, we go back to that. Well, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep mentioning how we procure these services. You still have contracts in the majority, not in the minority, that require X number of visits before you can return a case back to the client as unsuccessful. So simply saying the data says that this person cannot pay is not good enough. Or simply saying I wrote to this person and I believe they cannot pay is not good enough. You have to send an enforcement agent. Now, if you send an enforcement agent out to 10 addresses tomorrow morning that you know have no ability to pay, what do you think happens when they get to address number 11 who opens the door and cannot pay? It becomes a very big rush because they've just wasted five hours of their morning cleaning up stuff for contractual reasons that generates them absolutely no fees, no salary, because 80% of them are self-employed operating as micro businesses, which means that they get to house number 11 or car number 12, and it becomes hasty. And with haste becomes friction and with friction, complaints and then we talk about brand damage and reputation the industry the government the supplier and this can all be resolved these these cases i, I wanted to touch a little bit today on the media but some of these cases do blow up quite big when it happens. But there's there's a there's another part of the media that i look at and i think uh, you know i'm i'm I'm, talk, I'm talking about 
the, the can't pay, we'll take it away type um, programming. I'm talking about the YouTube generation with, you know, uh, if you went on YouTube 10 years ago, you would only see things like bailiffs got owned. These days, you're now starting to see some of the more forward thinking companies with some really professional videos explaining how the process works. And so I'm, I'm interested in the interplay between the enforcement industry itself and the media. How how is there a void in the media because the enforcement industry doesn't do enough to promote itself and the good things it does? And actually, maybe conversations like this where we can start articulating some of those problems. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I mean, you know, the reality are there are some industries that will never be favoured well by by the media, and it's all too easy to find a watchdog program or a panorama program on on certain sectors. It just is. You know, you put an undercover reporter into any business. Actually, if you we're, we're sat in my house today, so thank you for coming here, Steve. But if you put an undercover reporter into my house for three months, you could make a panorama program. <laughs> You know, it's. I'm not saying, and, and a lot of these programs are very useful and powerful, and and they drive change. But we've got to get away from this. Everybody pulling against each other. The government need enforcement agents and, and need to support them. The creditors need them. Society needs them. Let's remind people that you know. I would like to see some more positive messaging about. Well, one of the things we introduced at one of my enforcement companies in the past is. Right, we got the data from the local authority and we wrote to people and said, you're one of three people in your street that have not paid your council tax this year. This is the impact of that. By the way, as a reminder, this is what your council tax payments are spent on. Please pay. The compliance rates nearly doubled. So I would like to see more positive media about why it's important that people do pay for their parking charges, do pay for their council tax, do pay for their utility debt, et cetera. The, the reality is without it, it increases costs on everybody else. But one thing I should say that, you know, it's the enforcement agent that is always thrown underneath the bus, rightly or wrongly, when this stuff does blow up in the media. And because they're self-employed in the majority of cases acting as micro businesses, it's easy to do that. But we've got to remind ourselves and I think it's the, the one thing that, that still keeps me up of a night about this sector is that the majority of the industry are enforcement agents, yet they're the least heard voices. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to hear them. I recognize I've been in this industry for 20 odd years. I recognize they're a difficult voice to hear, just as if you were to get a bunch of black cab drivers together in a room, it's going to be loud and noisy, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't. And actually, I would argue that you must. And the biggest improvement I think that we will see in the immediate next few years is if the Enforcement Conduct Board recognise that and try and group those bunch of people together and let them be heard. Because I fear if we continue to not listen, we will go backwards. I have to say I completely agree with that. I think when whenever a change is involved, it's so important to listen to all the affected parties. And if you marginalise or sideline one, it, it, actually a very significant group within that overall industry, then people just become demoralised and disengaged. And it's, it's, it's then very hard to actually drive the improvements that you were looking for. Without a doubt. I mean, you know, you it's it's business, basic business 101. You take everybody on the journey, right? And you 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 create your values and your mission and your vision and you and you all go in a direction. The problem we have with the enforcement sector is it's never been done as a sector overall. It's all been done in pieces. And we do, I honestly believe, have the the ability to do that now with the ECB. But you know, the ECB is not without its own potential issues. The ECB has got to work out how itself, sufficiently apart from its funders and founders, which is the larger enforcement agencies themselves, to deliver the right outcomes for everybody involved. Now, you know, I've met with and spoke to a number of people at the ECB on many occasions, and I have to say I, I have great hope in their ability to do that. But it cannot be done without focusing on the majority part of the industry, which is the enforcement agents themselves. It is evident from any data you look at for the last few years that enforcement agents themselves have been underpaid while requiring more of them for the last five plus years. If that continues, we're in for a lot more panoramas, a lot more Daily Mail articles. 
I can assure you that. When you look at the way the fee structure has been since 2014, there's not been an increase. During that time, we've had COVID, we've had cost of living, we've had sky high interest rates on mortgages and property rental prices going through the roof. And yet the hard working, and it is a difficult job, the, the hard working people out there acting, as, as I've sometimes described as the executive arm of the justice system, out there on the streets and being neglected in terms of, of what they pay. And I think we all know that it's, it's quality cost and delivery if you if you don't pay the right money for the right job then you're not going to get the right outcomes and 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 you know it's worth reminding the the listeners that when the new fee structure was implemented in 2014 it was already out of date quite significantly actually so you know the the more recent proposed increases in fees were probably the right number to have put on them back in 2014 so this part of the community has been underpaid for potentially 12 years now the argument was always well they were overpaid for 12 years leading up to it and i think you're right i I honestly think you're right they were that's not their fault Government made that mistake in the fee structure that they implemented before then. You can't then punish them by underpaying them for 12 years. And also there's new people in the industry that didn't benefit from the 12 years of overpayments before. What you don't want, Steve, is you do not want an industry that's attracting lower paid professionals to do the job. You don't want people leaving certain sectors to come into this sector. And I'll be honest with you, I'll be I'll be more transparent on this. You don't want every doorman every bouncer to become an enforcement agent. What you want is you want people to aspire to become an enforcement agent because it's respected, government, all good private organisations and the media support what it's trying to achieve and that the pay is sufficient or even not good for the service that they provide. We haven't done that for over 10 years. The more recent fee proposed increases probably don't do it for the next 10 years. Because nobody is willing to make the very simple decision, which is set the fees that are right today and put a simple clause into regulations that say that these fees are subject to some form of indexation. You can argue over what that might be, CPI potentially, and allow that to then work forever. One difficult decision, done. Instead, what we'll do is we'll do a a review every five or six years. It will be two to three years out of date by the time we complete the review. We will then implement a new fee structure that's already out of date. We will then run it out of date for four to five years. And we will do it again and do it again. It's, it's insanity. But it will continue this way until one person, one person with the authority says enough is enough. Can we not hear what is being said? Can we not see the risks associated with keep on getting this wrong? Set it, put it onto indexation, allow these people to be paid rightly for the very difficult job that they perform. That's a really astute point. And I guess with with my background, Jamie, always looking at the political angle as well, with the way the media pick up on some of the work of the enforcement agents, it would probably be in in the government's favour if it just dealt with this once, grasped the nettle, and as you said, make some form of indexation so that we, we maintain a fair price for this throughout the future. Exactly. And, and you know, it, 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 and you put the right narrative around whoever stands up in, in Parliament and says, this is what we're doing and this is why we do it. You say this is vital. This is, you know, bringing in vital funds for our health system. This is bringing in vital funds for our policing system. You know, if you open the papers today, there will be lots of negative media about how the police force is underfunded. Well, the enforcement industry can assist in that funding if you get it right. So take the difficult decision to, to, the work's already been done. They've just done it. It's already a bit out of date. Of course it is, because it takes so long to do these things. But the work's done. You go, okay, well, when was it in date? What has the indexation been since then? Apply that for implementation date. I've now fixed the problem once and for all. And then I have an indexation clause in it that then fixes it for the next 100 years. And I go and I stand up in parliament and say, I've done this because the consequences of getting this wrong are... And it gets, of course, it'll still get bad media. Yeah. But it'll get bad media anyway. Yes. So let's do it once in the next 100 years and not once every five or six years. So I think the Ministry of Justice ministers just need to need to resolve this once and for all rather than this sticky tape from time to time because it's not going away. This is the second oldest industry to exist in the world.
When I see more in, in the online press, the, the Sun headline, and I, what I, I tend to do is go down and look at the comments. Because in the comments, you, you can get the, the mood of the nation. You see what Joe Public thinks. And something that always appears in there is, when I pay my bills, why shouldn't they? Now, I fully appreciate, as I, I know you do, that's, that's again, too simplistic because there, there, are, there are shades of grey. Yet when we talk about fair debt outcomes for everybody within the sector, that has to be for the client. The, the client deserves to get paid, but not at any cost. It has to be for the customer. You can't take money the customer hasn't got and belligerently trying to isn't going to help them or you. It has to be good for the agent, but it also has to be good for the person who pays on time every day. Otherwise, I think we drive behavioural disincentives to not pay. And I think that for me is is a, a really critical outcome of what you've just been talking about, about getting that pay right and getting it done once. Because then the average person on the street will know that there's an incentive to pay their bill because everybody else will be pursued or not pursued as the case may be but proportionately to their circumstances i i, to I totally agree with you and of course you know for the for the past few moments we've been focused solely on well how do you improve it by what the enforcement agents do and the and the charges but there is also there are some things that are currently in legislation that are just not followed because it's too difficult to follow and you know i've spoken about this on a number of occasions to ministers and government and this is the whole priority of debts it is very clear in the regulations and legislation that if somebody owes more than one debt that they should be grouped together and a single set of enforcement fees should be applied now we don't do that because we have an industry that's made up of a number of enforcement agents and a number of enforcement agencies so what happens is people procure one or two or three or five suppliers and they issue cases all over the place which means that again let's use myself jamie waller could owe one local authority money another local authority money the magistrates court money and the utility company money. And what that involves is that I get four letters all charging me 70, 80 pounds, and straight away it become unpayable for me. And when I call up enforcement agency number one and say, look, I'm really sorry, I've got this letter, but I've also got three other letters. Enforcement agency number one has one priority, get the money off them first. Whatever you do, if you've been fortunate enough, so what happens is they get tougher on you because they don't want you to call, if they're the one who gives you the payment arrangement, but then you go to enforcement agency number two, who are tougher on you and you pay it all up, someone somewhere is gonna lose out because you're gonna run out of money. But this was all created because you had four letters and four compliance fees in the first place. Let's go a bit further and say, well, you didn't respond because you buried your head in sand and thought, I just can't pay this. Now, all of a sudden there's four visits. Now, all of a sudden you owe an additional 1,000 pounds. The first enforcement agency that knocks on your door and you open it and you say, well, I've got three others of these. I simply cannot pay it. What are they incentivized to do? Seize goods as quickly as possible so that when enforcement agent number three turns up, they don't seize them and make them unseizable for me. And we saw this in a very public case between two enforcement agencies just a few years ago, where they then, they went to someone's house, seized their goods, but left them with them, which was the right thing to do. You can set up a payment plan, pay me over time. That enforcement agency did what was the perfect job. Absolutely, on paper, exactly what they should have done. Enforcement agency number two turned up two days later and said, I'm going to seize your goods. They said, well, they've already been seized by enforcement agency number one. And enforcement agency number two was like, oh, what do you mean? I'm not going to get my money. So they said, well, we don't care. We're going to take them anyway unless you can pay us. Now, it was probably an empty threat at that stage. But then the threat became reality because the person said, well, I simply cannot pay. I simply cannot pay. So what happened is enforcement agency number two forced them to pay. They did pay in the end. And it was about £10,000, a significant payment. But then enforcement agency number one, quite rightly, called enforcement agency number two and said, you took the money on goods that we had seized. You need to send us the money. And enforcement agency number two said, no way am I sending the money. I got the money. You didn't get the money. Go to hell. Enforcement agency number one then took enforcement agency number two to court. And the judge, of course, agreed because it's clear in legislation that there is such thing as the priority of debts. And the oldest debt, the debt that goes to enforcement agency first, prioritizes all others. So the reason I, I took so long to explain this, Steve, is if we simply got that bit right, if we simply said that there was a central distribution of files, 
all debts went into a central place and were grouped together. And when they went to enforcement agency number one, if another debt came in, it went to enforcement agency number one. If another debt came in, it went to enforcement agency number one. So you, we would reduce the amount owed by the public. I've got the data somewhere. I, I don't want to claim numbers, but I mean significantly. And all of a sudden, every single one pound that is paid by a debtor on the door or on the phone, significantly more of it will go towards the principal amount. Happier creditors, happier debtors, slightly less work for the enforcement sector, but easier work because it's grouped, which means less cost of delivery. We end up with a completely different sector. So we can resolve a lot by more regulation through the ECB. We can resolve a lot by allowing the enforcement agents to be heard and make sure we listen to them. We can achieve a lot by sorting out the fee regulation and attaching it to indexation. We can completely transform the industry if we simply build a society that follows the legislation and the regulations that have been sat there for tens and tens and tens of years. Can you imagine that? Every utility company gets access to more of their debt repaid on time. Every local authority, more of their debt paid on time. Every central government organization, child support, HMRC, simply by following the rules that are already there. Sounds like a, an episode of Forty Towers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's frustrating for me, you know, because I, I think because I've got the view of the whole system from having been the person to knock on people's doors, to, to being the small business owner, the large business owner, and now within the integration sector as an investor, I think I can see it all and I can just, I don't understand why we would not resolve it when it has such a large impact on so many. You know, and we're not just talking about people not being able to pay, Steve. I'm talking about the softer stuff that we can't see. You know, it's easy to put, to attach data to things like, oh, um, well, those are in debt are, uh, you know, in this social economic uh, category, etc. The things that we don't see is uh, what does the letter landing on the doorstep do behind closed doors? Is it increasing domestic violence? Is it increasing hardship upon children? Are children not being sent to school because people are frightened to open the doors in case the bailiff puts their foot in it? Are people committing suicide? It's all happening. If we have any ability to make changes that are positive, I would say that we all have the absolute responsibility to do so. And it can be done. We've spoken a lot about the benefits of integration. And what you've just said there is actually, you can apply those benefits on a national level. Yeah, look, I'm not here to tell you why I believe integration is better than the traditional model that's, that's been followed. That would be too, too simplistic. But what I can say is that if we build a solution that delivers to the requirements of the legislation, that the improvements that come off the back of that are so significant that they are larger than anything that's ever been done in this sector in the last 100 years. Is integration that? It's partially that. Is it, is it in four? I don't know. Could be. But it also could be something else. So I'm not saying that what I'm an investor in has found the ideal solution. I'm sure there are other solutions and they should all be explored because it's simply the right thing to do. I guess I remember when I was campaigning for a single customer view of debt across government debts and we were talking about pre, pre breathing space era. Step change actually let me write a rather cheeky blog in which I said the reason we needed step change is because we all went after the slice of the pie for ourselves rather than putting in place the technology to allow us to divvy that disposable income pie up. And what we were effectively doing is outsourcing that to the debt advice sector. Whereas you wouldn't need a debt advice sector that is as big as it is if we just put the investment into the, uh, the collection sector, the enforcement sector itself. Of course, and the, and the simple reality of the debt advice sector is that there is a window before people get there. And that window will be use to the best of the commercial organization's ability to recover their money before they get there. And that's the small window that has been created that shouldn't be there, but is there, is where all of these problems exist. But see, if, if we had a single view of the person in debt and we were able to group their cases as is required by law, but we just all failed to do, 
we would simply reduce the debt burden of the country by such a significant amount that you will reduce the debt advice sector overnight. You will reduce the debt advice sector, you will reduce complaint, you will reduce the industry will get smaller. But that's not a bad thing. And we haven't touched base on this, but the enforcement industry hasn't grown for 20 years. It's already under-resourced for the requirements upon it. So actually, making the requirements less is a good thing, not a bad thing. We want fewer enforcement agents that are better, fewer enforcement agencies that are better. And we also want fewer people in debt, or at least those that are in debt, being charged fewer fees because their debt's being grouped together at an earlier stage, and there's one set of charges for one set of actions. It makes no sense. I always used to say, I sat in a, in a procurement meeting with one of the largest local authorities in the country about 10 years ago. And I said, they were talking about using five enforcement agencies and they weren't going to allocate cases on any sensible manner, like everybody beginning, surname beginning W goes to enforcement agency one. That's a very basic thing you yeah. can do. They weren't intending to do that. They were intending to each month issue whatever cases they had in that month to enforcement agency one, next month two, next month three, which meant we're all going to end up getting the, the, the same people that are in debt. And I said, could you imagine procuring your refuge collection contract on the same manner? So you're going to use three bin companies and say, who's ever bin you collect, you'll get paid a tenner. Can you imagine what that, what that borough would be like at 4 a.m. on a Monday morning with these 12 and a half ton bin lorries racing down the streets trying to get, you know, fight. They'd, they'd be pulling bins or bags off each other, rubbish everywhere for the £10 per bin. That's what's happening. You know, I know it's a very simplistic way to paint this picture, but it's what's happening. And what does that create? I mean, I, you don't need me to tell you this, but it's more simple to turn a blind eye to it than to resolve it. But the legislation, the law says we should do it. So how do we all believe that we shouldn't develop and deliver what is required of us in law? So we simply just say, well, it's too difficult to deliver that. It was written at a time when, and this is the argument that I've heard from ministers, it was written at a time when there wasn't so many people in debt, that parking wasn't decriminalised, that there weren't cameras for, for congestion charge, when council tax wasn't such a big issue. I, I, I'm not convinced. It's not a good enough reason. It's not a good enough reason to reduce the amount people owe in society by such a significant amount. That almost says to me that then you, you have to question, is the legislation fit for purpose? Does it need modernising? Does it need bringing up to actually today's standards to reflect today's community? You mean like simply putting an indexation clause <laughs> and fee structure? <laughs> this, these things seem too difficult to, on some occasions, Steve. But yes, you're, you're, you're completely right. But then I would sit here and say to you that it's not too difficult to implement. Actually, if you were to give me the ability to do so, I, I would implement it tomorrow um, because there is commercial reason to do so. While, yes, I've sat here and said it will reduce the size of the industry. While, yes, it will reduce the amount of fees charged in the enforcement industry significantly, really significantly. And that does probably mean fewer companies or smaller companies. But... I would argue more profitable, less cost associated with them. Uh, in many cases, certainly in sectors like this, fewer is not necessarily the wrong thing. It's probably better because we can increase the quality of it. But I don't know, it's probably, I'm dyslexic, Stephen. It's, it's a common thing that people with dyslexia really suffer with injustice. And for me, I don't really care about the commercial reasons. <laughs> what I care about is, should it be done? Is it the right thing to do? You know, I've always had that saying that everybody deserves to be paid what they are owed, but not at any cost. And it's the full stop and the gap in my breath before the, but not at any cost, is the part of that sentence that I believe that everybody should hear and, and, and listen to. Jamie Waller, thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the podcast and I hope you found it as fascinating as I did. If you want to hear more great content from Aram and Just, then please subscribe on whichever platform you use to get your podcasts or follow us on LinkedIn so that we can let you know when the next one is out. Until then, if you'd like to discuss any of the issues that were raised in this podcast, then please get in touch with me either on LinkedIn or drop me an email to stephen.coppard at aram.co.uk. Once again, my thanks to Jamie Waller for investing the time to talk to us and it's goodbye for now.